All right. And, um, this evening's sermon, before I even get started, you know, there's a lot of things. I just want to touch real quickly on um, just on our attitudes because this is a subject that I don't think is going to be offensive to anybody in, in our church at all. I think this is what I'm going to be preaching on is, is going to be well received, at least from the people within these walls. But it is a subject that will, that, that can very easily provoke people to anger and a lot of people get upset by. Um, and it's one of many things that the Bible teaches that many people can get upset with. And I just want to reiterate, not that I think that, that people here, again, are going to have a problem with this particular sermon, but in general and in our life and in our Christian life, you know, we ought to maintain a spirit of humility and let God's word just, just rule over what we believe is right and wrong. And especially like if you, you know, hearing different things, and I think it's applicable for, for different strives and problems and contentions that may be going on among people that you like and know and everything. You know, we need to, if we want to understand what's right and wrong, we need to go to God's word and let God's word be supreme. And, and whatever this book says is going to determine what is right and wrong in, in every situation. And you know, there's going to be people who are right and wrong about various things, but we need to just, just try to not be respective of persons in any regard, but, but let this word dictate what's true. And I, you know, I, I bring that up because I think it's relevant in general uh, just all the time. It's always something that's going to be relevant. We need to be going to the word of God. And, and sometimes, you know, it, it may make you uncomfortable because when people are wrong, the Bible tells us what's right and wrong. And even if it's someone that you like or, or know or whatever, so you know, people that you like do things that are wrong sometimes. And when uh, the Bible teaches a certain way, then that's, you know, it is what it is. And I just bring that up because I think it's also pertinent for what I'm going to be preaching on today, because today I'm going to be preaching on Israel. And that's, that's kind of, um, and specifically in Mark 12 here, when I was preparing for my sermon, I was just trying to determine what I was going to preach on. For, for some reason, this kind of hit me harder than it ever has just doing my regular, excuse me, my regular Bible reading. Starting off with this parable in Mark chapter 12, right at the beginning, it really got me thinking, you know, try, like putting myself, uh, you know, sometimes you like to put yourself in the situation. And, and Jesus explains things in ways and he uses parables oftentimes to help people understand what he's talking about. And I know I'm a little, a little late on the game when it comes to this whole, you know, people all supporting Israel like a week or two ago when all the bombings and stuff were going on. But I don't always just preach based on what's going on in the world because the support of Israel, Christian Zionism and stuff has been going on for a real long time anyways. Okay, this is something that, and it's something that people get really upset about as well. And that's another reason why I bring up uh, this, yeah, that prologue to my sermon because it is something that people get really fired up about now, just because people might get offended and fired up doesn't mean that we shouldn't have boldness to just stand firm on the truth in God's word. Absolutely, we need to just defend the word of God, but we also need to maintain some humility throughout all of it because, you know, it is God's word, not our own. It's not my own beliefs. If I, if I happen to be wrong on something, I need to, to adjust to make sure it fits with God's word. But it doesn't mean I, I have to... Re, um, scale back any boldness when I know that the Bible says something's true, then it's true. And I'm going to go full steam ahead with that. And that just goes for any type of hard preaching. And the reason why it's hard is because a lot of people, it's going to be hard for people to receive. And it's because they have other vested interests, whether they be emotional ties, whether it be to people or, or just doctrines or long held views or whatever the case may be. Right. Um, but this is, this is, I like that this passage is in here because I think it helps illustrate how God truly feels about some things here. And Jesus has given us this parable, just like we could understand how does God really feel about other subjects. Well, when we look at God's law and we can see, you know, some severity of punishment on certain sins that today we might not think is that big of a deal. Well, that helps give us an insight on how big of a deal it really is. Right? I mean, the most, the most obvious one would be like sodomy. You know, the Bible puts a death penalty on that. Today, it's just kind of like, I mean, it should be no big deal. It's supposed to be accepted and loved and promoted and everybody should tolerate everything else. But, you know, if you want to know what God really feels about it, go to his word. 
I mean, he put the death penalty on it. It doesn't get any more severe than that. Right. And it's not just that one thing. That's just a really obvious one, especially this month. But what about, you know, um, kidnapping? What about rape? Murder? Uh, you know, all these other charges that, that these crimes that are worthy of death penalty. Or how about a son smiting his dad in the face? That's another death penalty, by the way, in the Bible. And that's, a, oh, I can't believe it. You know what? Then you are just way out of balance and way out of whack, and you don't know what's right and what's not right. And you need to get your face back in the Bible because God tells us what's right and what's not right. And this culture and the society and the world changes, but God doesn't change. So we need to always make sure we're going back to this book. And, you know, with, with, with Christianity, Christianity has changed. The views on Israel and Zion and the Jews, that's changed in recent years. There wasn't always this love for the Jew that we have today. It's been something that's been introduced in much more recent years. But you still need to let the Bible decide and tell you how we should think and feel about these things. And when we look at, when I was reading this, this, this passage, I just kind of like, I was thinking about this, going, putting myself in this position and going, wow, how wicked. And, and this is try, and he's doing this to, to help us understand how wicked Israel had become. Now look at verse number one in Mark chapter 12. The Bible says, and he began to speak unto them by parables. A certain man planted a vineyard and set an hedge about it and digged a place for the wine fat and built a tower and let it out to husband and went into a far country. So here's this guy. He puts forth all this work. It's his property. He's got this vineyard. He does all, he plants the vineyard, plants all the, the plants in, in, in his land. He builds a hedge about it. He's protecting it from animals. You know, he's fencing it in. He digs a place for the wine fat. So when, when the, the grapes come off, you can produce the wine. That place is all built. He builds a tower. It's all ready to go. He does all the work for this. Now, and this is, you know, there's so many directions you could take on this. Because I'm sick of hearing all the, the liberal communist type of propaganda. Oh, the workers, we deserve all this stuff. Well, what about the guy who built everything? You know, if, you, if you didn't have the workers, you'd have nothing, and we deserve all this stuff, and this whole worker communist mentality. If you didn't have the guy that, that set up everything and built everything and, and let it out for you to have a job, then you wouldn't have a job. If this guy didn't take on the risk, if he didn't take on the challenge, if he didn't do all that hard work himself, then you'd have nothing. There's a sense of entitlement of, oh, well, we're doing all this stuff, and we're turning the gears, and we're, you know, we're making things happen. We deserve to have all this money and everything else. Like, no, you don't. You deserve to have whatever, and someone's willing to pay you to do a job. But I don't want to go down that path, because <laughs> it's a whole other thing. But when you just think about this, like, imagine that's you, and you put forth all this effort, and you build this, this nice vineyard, and you get it all ready to go, and everything's set up, and you go, you know what, okay, now I'm going to hire these people, but it's still, it's my vineyard. This is my place. This is my work, and, and yeah, you're going to pay them, but it's still your stuff, your fruit, your vineyard, everything that you made, Right? And he's saying, I've got other business to attend to somewhere else. So I'm going to go into this country over here, and I'm going to let you guys work the land for me. Verse 2, and at the season, so basically, he gives it a season. There's supposed to be this yield. There's supposed to be some profit. There's supposed to be production done on the vineyard. It says, at the season, he sent to the husbandman a servant that he might receive from the husbandman of the fruit of the vineyard. He needs his cut because it's his vineyard. It's all his stuff. He invested in it. It only makes sense, right? But look what it says. And they caught him and beat him and sent him away empty. Now, even just this first time that happened, I mean, that would infuriate me. If you put all that work forth and someone just is like, just, just has total disregard for, for you and for, for everything that you've done for them, providing that work for them, to just beat up the guy that's coming and say, okay, well, my master wants his you know, once his end, you, you must have produced stuff this year. You know, where, where's, where's, his, where's his cut? And they just beat him up and they say, get out of here. It's all ours. That's wicked. Now, and that's just, that's just one time. Look at how this story continues. It says in verse 4, And again he sent unto them another servant, 
And at him they cast stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully handled. So now they're sort of ramping up the violence. Verse 5, and again he sent another, and him they killed. So he's sending these people like, look, this is my vineyard. You've got you to give me what's coming to me. This is mine. And they end up murdering the guy that he sends and says, and many others, beating some and killing some. So he's like, what is wrong with these people, right? And then he says in verse 6, having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, they will reverence my son. He's saying, like, they're not respecting these servants. They're not respecting these employees, you know, these other people that I'm sending over there, these employees. They're just not respecting them. But you know what? If I send my son, they'll listen to my son. Imagine you having one son and having this property, and they're handling all these people. And they're like, son, I've got this job for you. I mean, these people are out of hand. You need to go down there and, and you know, see what's going on. And, and, and get what we, we deserve, get what's coming to us, right? They, they're supposed to be working for us. And he sends his only son, and it says in verse 7, but those husbandmen said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. So they just plot to kill the son. And I, I mean, how demented do you have to be to be thinking like, oh, well, we'll just inherit all this stuff then because he was the inheritor of everything. Now it's the inheritance is going to fall to us since we're working the land. And that's how insane these people had become that were doing this stuff. It is, it's insanity. But see, that's how insane the Pharisees and the Jews became at that point against the Lord because that's, who this, that's what this parable is all about. And that's how insane they were that even though Jesus was performing all these miracles and stuff among them, they still didn't believe. They still just wouldn't accept what he was doing because they had gone mad against the Lord and they had, they had just become full-blown reprobate. And it says in verse number eight, and they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husbandmen and will give the vineyard unto others. And have ye not read this scripture, the stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. This was the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hold on him but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them, and they left him and went their way. These are the Jews. These are the Pharisees. They were saying they knew he was speaking the parable against them. Now, obviously, this, I mean, this, this is a serious parable that, he, that he's teaching here. The, the context of, of that, th this is how God is likening the nation of Israel saying, look, I gave you a job to do. I put you in that promised land. I made it real nice for you, right? It's, it's all prepared. It's all hedged about. You're protected. You're safe. I gave you this nice land. All you got to do is work. And obviously, he's not worried about the physical product. He's worried about the spiritual product. I've given you my word. You've got the oracles of God. You've got all of this going for you. You've got the temple, you've got, you know, you've got these prophets, you've got these men of God that I'm working directly with in your nation. You have all of this stuff. Now, where is the fruit? And then at every turn, you see them, they're going after other gods, they're forsaking the Lord, they're doing this, they're doing that, and they're not bringing forth the fruit. Yeah. <laughs> they're not doing it. And... This is how God views them. This is how God views that nation. This is how God views those servants. What do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen to these people? And look, when it's talking about he's sending these servants, that's talking about the prophets. That's talking about God's people that he's been sending under the nation of Israel for years and years and years. And how are they treated? They're abused. How are they treated? They're thrown in prison. How are they treated? They're beaten and stoned and sawn asunder. That's how they're treated. And they're not just treated that way of the world, they're treated by the way of their own people. That's the history of the prophets. You think Jeremiah, oh, that was just the Babylonians. No, it wasn't. The Babylonians were freeing them and saying, hey, you can go wherever you want to go, Jeremiah. It was the Jews that were casting them into the dungeon that would have killed him, that were telling them to stop preaching. That's who it was. And all throughout history, that's who it is. 
It's God's own servants. But see, this is clearly what the Bible is teaching here. Now, obviously, this is a parable, but even the people at the time, even the Pharisees at the time, they knew it was about them. And what was their response to that? They want to get him. They want to kill Jesus. Just from, just from hearing that, they're like, it just makes them so angry. Now, why would it make them so angry? Because the truth hurts. And because they were full of pride. They weren't able to receive a message like this with humility. Instead, they hardened their heart and stiffened their neck and want to fight against it instead of just receiving this and going, oh, man, our fathers have done really wickedly. We've done wickedly. We need to repent. We need to get right. But they didn't accept that, which is why God ends up casting them out and destroys them. Turn over, you would, to Matthew 21. It's going to be the same account. We're not going to read the entire thing again, but it's interesting. We're going to look at Mark, Matthew, and Luke because they all have this parable in it. And there's, a li there's slightly different details that you could get, glean out of each one. And seeing the attitude of these Pharisees is very telling And I don't know how anyone can walk away from the scripture and just think that God has this undying love for the physical nation of Israel. Or that somehow we should give our undying support and love for the physical nation of Israel today. These, these Jews, these, these Christ-rejecting Jews, that somehow that's what God wants us to do when we can see very clearly how they're being described back in Jesus' day, saying, hey, they, they're the ones responsible for the death of the prophets. They're the ones that were responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. His only, I mean, yeah, you say, oh, well, that's just a parable. Well, don't worry, we'll get to that. Because the Bible clearly tells us who was ultimately responsible. You say, but it was the Roman soldiers that crucified him. But they weren't the ones only responsible for that. Herod wanted to let him go. Pilate wanted to let him go. Both of them. They, I mean, they, they, neither one of them wanted to just have his blood on their hands. They were both willing to do it, but you know who wasn't letting them let it go? The Jews. They were the ones behind it. Matthew 21, look at verse number 40. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Of course that's what he's going to do. Those wicked people ought to be destroyed. They're going to be destroyed. You know what? But he still wants to get some use out of his land. He still wants it to be plowed. He still wants to gain from it. So you know what he's going to do? He's going to hire other servants to go ahead and do the work. Someone who's actually going to do the work and bring forth the fruit. Which is why then in, in both of these cases, or in all these cases, then he brings up, uh, Jesus brings up the scripture. He says, did you never read in the scriptures a stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Saying, Didn't you, haven't you ever read that scripture? And we're going to get into that in just a minute. Uh, I want to I finish up here. Look at verse number 43. The Bible says, therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. So this is, how, this is where we get the explanation of the parable. You know, it's pretty obvious already, but you can, you can make a claim that, well, it's not about that, it's about something else, until you read Matthew 21, 43, and he says, therefore say I unto you. So, well, this is why. So the kingdom of God is going to be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. It's done. You've had your opportunity. You are those wicked husbandmen. You are the ones not bringing forth the fruit. It's taken away from you, and you know what? He's going to let it out or hire out some other servants, another nation, to go ahead and, and bring forth the fruits thereof. It's pretty easy to see that. And you know what that means? That means Israel has been replaced. They've been replaced. I don't know how else you, could, you can take this and see this. They've been replaced. They weren't doing the job. They're supposed to be bringing forth the fruit. So God says, nope, you're gone. You're in. And you know what? If you don't do it, if you did what they did, you're out too, and I'll find someone else to do it. 
And that's the way that God deals with any nation that wants to claim the Lord. Hey, he'll give you a shot. Go ahead. Work for me. Work for me. Work for me. You know what? You're not going to work for him? You're going to thumb your nose at God? You're going you're gonna, to you know, disrespect the Lord and you're going to go after strange gods? You're out of there too. No one is just grandfathered in or given this respect just out of who your ancestors were. I mean, if he didn't give the respect to the Jews for that reason, then why would he do that for anyone else? And the, he's, I mean, over and over again, the Bible says that God's not a respecter of persons. In the New Testament, we find over and over again to avoid genealogies that it's not, that, that, that has nothing to do with it anymore. Why? Because God made that break with the children of Israel. Cast them out. Done. Replaced. Verse 44 says, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard these parables, they perceived that he spake of them. They know that he's talking about them. Now, I can't even imagine. I mean, imagine what that must feel like. That's a pretty scathing parable. So they killed some, they beat some, they killed his only son. He's like, they're talking about me. They're talking about us. They get it. So this parable isn't some cryptic thing. They were able to pick up what he's throwing down there that they know yeah, he's talking about us, which is also why um, they, they were planning, they wanted to kill him, they wanted to put hands on him and, and do him harm, but they couldn't just because there's other people that, you know, they were worried that they, they didn't have enough support from other people there that they're not going to let that actually happen, right? If they could have, they would have killed him right there. And what's also interesting then is in Luke chapter 20, I'm just going to read a couple of verses. You can turn there if you want, but I'll read these verses real quickly. Verses 15 and 16 of Luke 20. The Bible says, So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, talking about the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests, they said, God forbid. How messed up is your mind have to be to say, oh, God forbid he would give it to someone else. They've been killing the people. He killed his only son. They're not, they're not doing the job. They're not doing the work. They're not giving him anything. Oh, God forbid you take it away from him. You're mad. It's insane. And, and to me, it's, it's the same level of insanity for a Christian to think that we ought to be supporting a nation that is still exhibiting the same exact behavior and pattern that Israel did a long time ago. It's not like it's so much different now and all of a sudden, no, 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 these people are way different because I don't believe that just because, you know, physically they may have descended from there. I mean, hey, if modern day Israel was just this great lighthouse of Christianity, I would say, praise God. They say, yeah, that was then, but, but hey, now they've been grafted back into that olive tree. But they're not grafted back in. Because they haven't repented, they haven't turned to Jesus yet. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. So in, in these parables and the stories that Jesus is bringing up here, of course, uh, we saw this a couple times, the reference to Psalm 118, and, and Psalm 118 has a reference to stone which the builders refuse has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. So he's applying that Old Testament prophecy to this same uh, parable of the, the husbandman and the vineyard. And of course, that stone, being, which we know now is Jesus Christ, that he's the stone which the builders refused, He's the stone, that's the person that the husbandman killed, that only begotten son, that, 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 that well-beloved son that they murdered. He's become the head stone of the corner. He becomes that chief building block. It says, this is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is God's doing. It was God's doing to get rid of the nation of Israel. It's God's doing that Jesus would come and make that sacrifice for the sins of the world. 
And it was God's doing that he's going to, he, he's finally using this event to completely just be done using the, the, the children of Israel as the nation that's supposed to be bringing forth the fruits because they've been derelict in their duties, because they haven't been uh, living up to their responsibilities. Now, I, I, we're going to 1 Peter chapter 1 because this also makes reference of the stone. Well, chapter 2 actually has the, the reference of, of the stone which the builders refused to become the head stone in the corner. I had to turn to chapter 1 first just to get the context of 1 Peter in general. Okay, verse 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, the Bible says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Strangers means foreigners. So the, the entire book here of 1 of, of Peter it's written to foreigners, which means it's not written to any of the physical seed of Israel. It's not meant for, you know, we have the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews was meant for physical Jews, right? Spiritual Jews, yes, but, but physical as well. So, the, you know, people who, who, would, who would claim that lineage, that has more application for them because it, it provides more insight and, and understanding of what has changed. This is written to the strangers that are scattered throughout these, these regions of the Gentiles, the, the Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Verse 2, look, it says, elect. So these strangers are elect, right? They're chosen. I thought it was the Jews who were chosen. Well, the Bible says right here that the stra these strangers are elect. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit. How do they become elect? Through sanctification of the Spirit because they put their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. The strangers are elect. This is who this is written to. Now go over to chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2. And again, you know, we need to put emotions aside. We need to put any indoctrination you might have had aside and let the Bible be the authority, be the word of God. You know, we see how strongly God felt about the nation of Israel not bringing forth the fruits thereof and saying, hey, he's going to miserably destroy those wicked men because of how they're behaving. And it's summarizing their work as just being beating some, killing some, shamefully entreating them, and, and then being upset when God's going to go ahead and take it away from them. But that's the truth. That's the truth of the matter. 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse number 6. The Bible reads, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe. Again, these are the strangers that are also called elect. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient. What does that mean, disobedient? Disobedient in faith. Disobedient because they didn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient. Again, they're stumbling at the word. Why are they disobedient? Because they're stumbling at the word. They don't understand the word of God. They're not receiving the word of God. They're not putting their trust in the word of God. Whereunto also they were appointed. Look at verse number 9. But ye, who's he talking to? The strangers. But ye are a chosen generation. Wow, well, you're chosen. You know another word for chosen is elect. You are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. What do you mean these, gen these Gentiles are a priesthood? Yep. These strangers. But they're not allowed into the temple. Remember the Jews wanted, wanted to basically kill the apostle Paul because they thought he brought Timotheus into the temple. It's like, look. They're a royal priesthood according to Peter, and holy nation. Hmm. If he's speaking this way, you're chosen, you're a royal priesthood, you're a holy nation, kind of looks like God is deciding to use another nation now to bring forth the fruits of his vineyard. A peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people. In the past, they weren't the people of God. But are now the people of God. So that's, where did it change? I thought, I thought the children of Israel were the children of God. Yet they were considered that. 
They were the chosen people for a while when God, when God was giving, you know, sending all of his prophets and continued to try to get them to do his work until he had enough, until he sent his only begotten son into the world and, and, and to those people, and they rejected him and killed him and murdered him and hung him up on a cross. That's when God had enough and said, you know what? I'm done with you. I'm taking it away from you. I'm taking away the kingdom of God from you. I'm giving it to another nation. And now they weren't called a people before. Now they're the people of God. But they're Gentiles. Yep. Because God's not a respecter of persons. Which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Romans chapter 9. I mean, again, these, these are all very... Um, common passages, especially if you're, if you're familiar with this subject and with this topic, but it, it's, worth, it's worth going over and proving because we have to go based off of what Scripture teaches. And in totality, in context, you know, this is another reason why it's important when we deal with subjects like this not to just preach off of one passage, I'm not going to preach an entire sermon just off of a parable from Mark 12 and watch out for the people who want to support Zionism and they want to look at one passage or one verse and then preach for an hour about how we need to support Israel because the Bible says that you know, God will bless them and blesses thee and curse him and curses thee, so we better bless or else we're going to be cursed. And that's what happens out there. But they're not letting the Bible speak for itself. They're going to a passage, ripping it out of context. That's talking specifically to Abraham. That's why it says thee. That's right. yeah. Doesn't say ye. Doesn't say all of his children and all of his descendants. It says thee. Right. God's going to bless those that blessed Abraham literally when he was on the earth, walking around and doing his thing. And God was leading him to a land that, that he wasn't born in. He didn't know where he was going. And we can see that play out. We could actually see the people being blessed or being threatened with a curse if they laid any hands on Abraham because God was protecting him, just like Abimelech when he goes into the kingdom, into, the, into their nation and, he's, and you know, he sees in a dream, hey, don't lay any hands on him because God's warning him, you know, he's my servant. He belongs to me. You better not mess with him. Don't lay hands on him. Don't lay hands on his wife. So yeah, it plays out. I'm going to bless them that bless thee and curse them that curses thee. Because God protected his friend Abraham in his journeys and in his travels. We'll start applying that to, to an entire group of people that reject Christ and reject God and they have nothing to do with the Lord. Romans chapter 9, verse number 3, the Bible reads, For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. So this is where the Apostle Paul, he's bringing up the fact that he really wants other native Jews to be saved. So according to the flesh, right? This, we have same ancestry. These are my people. And man, if I could even just give myself to be a curse so that, so that they could be saved, I would do it. This is the heart that the Apostle Paul had for his kindred, his people. And there's nothing wrong with that either. You know, the people, your nationality, where you come from, and wanting to get those people saved, wherever it is where you, where you originate from, great, sure, that makes sense. You want those people to be saved. I mean, they're, they're related to you, right? They're closer to you. You have got a, you know, a, a, more of a connection with certain people. I understand that, and there's nothing wrong with that. But look at what the Bible's saying about them, though, in this passage, because he's saying he's referring to them being according to the flesh. Verse 4, who are Israel, Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. So there were a lot of good things that God did for the Israelites, for people who were physically born into that land, into that nation, they were given the law. They were given the law of God. I mean, the law of God came through Israel. It came through those people. The services of God, right? Do, doing all of the, the sacrifices. That was for the Levites. The, those, those children of Israel were, were given that special task and that job to do those things. The, um, the promises, right? These covenants. All of that was delivered to Israel. So yeah, they had a great step forward. There was some great blessing from that. It says, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came. What another blessing to be the people 
from whom God chose for the Savior to be born. There was a good reason, a good, and, and, and you know, they carried a, a good name in the sense that God chose them to be the people who he, who he delivered all these things unto. Just like in that parable, he delivered a vineyard all set up and ready to go. Hey, I'm delivering you all this stuff. I'm making it so that you can be successful. See, God did all the stuff that he can do to make them successful. But it's up to them to actually do the work. And they failed miserably. Verse 6 says, Not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. And that's a key there. Not everyone... Um, that are of Israel, like in this physical sense, they're not all Israel. That's not who God considers Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. So now he's, he's making a very clear distinction between physically how they were born, what their physical lineage is, and whether or not they're a child of Abraham or considered to be part of Israel. Because the promises came to Abraham. The promises were made to Abraham and to Israel and to his seed, right? But you can't just start applying that to some guy that was physically descended from these people. Because that doesn't mean anything. Because God's able of these stones to raise up seed unto Abraham. That's what John the Baptist said. Hey, don't, you know, when, they, when, they came, when the Pharisees came to the baptisms, and he's like, think not to say within yourself that we have Abraham to our father, for God is able these stones to raise up seed unto Abraham. He's like, that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. Don't think that you're special. Don't think that you're in some special class and category because you are descended from Abraham. But that's how Christians today view Israel. They view the Jews as like, oh, well, they're these special people, and you know, they've got a special past because they're these chosen people. No, they're not. They're not the chosen people anymore. They were. You know what? God took away that title. God took away that name. He's not, he didn't choose them for anything anymore. All the things that he chose them to do is already done. And when Jesus Christ came forward of physically of that nation, of that seed, done. Now there's a new nation that's elect. Now there's a new nation that he's using to bring, forward, uh, bring forth the fruits thereof. It says in verse 7, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. You could turn, if you go to Galatians chapter 3, just following up on the same exact point, and there's so many scriptures you could turn to that prove this in the Bible. It's hard to fit it all into one sermon. It's actually impossible to fit it all into one sermon. That's why there was an entire event, one of the first events out here, but right when this church started was that Marching to Zion conference, which was awesome, by the way. And I don't know if we still have any DVDs of that. I think we do. It's called the Anti-Israel um, Conference. I wasn't too keen on the name of that because, you know, it depends on what you mean by Israel, right? Physical Israel is different than spiritual Israel. I mean, we are Israel. But the way that, you know, there's so many, there's so much good preaching out of that, out on this truth, because it's found all throughout the Bible. It's found all throughout Scripture. When you look at who are the elect, well, it's not talking about physical Jews. It's either talking about Jesus Christ, the elect, or those who are elect through him, through Christ, because he's the elect. That makes us part of the elect as well. But uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, the Bible says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That's what makes you a child of God. That's what makes you an heir. That's what gives you an inheritance is because you're born into God's family. But how does that happen? By faith in Christ Jesus. Just like John chapter 1 says, But as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's when you become a son of God. You believe on his name. By faith in Christ Jesus, you become a child of God. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. So he's saying, it doesn't matter what your lineage is, it doesn't matter your descendancy, you're all one in Christ Jesus. So whether you were physically descended from Abraham or not, hey, if your faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're a child of God and you're an heir. Amen. 
And you get to share in those promises made to Abraham, like verse 29 says, and if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Hey, if you're Christ, you're part of the seed. You're in the family. Amen. That's what God looks at. He looks at spiritualism. He looks at not the physical seed, but the spiritual. He looks at, are you a child of promise? Because the child of promise came by faith. Then, you know, the Bible talks about Ishmael being, you know, is an allegory. That he was born of the flesh, but Isaac was a child of, of promise. He was the one that was promised unto Abraham. He was the one that came of his old age. He was the one that came through faith. He was the one that was a miraculous birth. After it was past the time of women uh, with Sarah, that she was still able to conceive. God gave her strength to conceive seed. And that she was able to bring forth that child of promise that could only happen through faith. Because when they went to the flesh, that wasn't the child of promise. But you know what? Even those, even those descendants of Ishmael, if they put their faith in Christ, then they're Abraham's seed as well. They're considered a child of promise, even physically if they weren't. I'll turn, if you would, to Matthew 23. Because again, looking at how God views, okay, and just to be fair, this is how God viewed the Jews at the time of Jesus Christ, in context. Now, I don't think that's changed, and I think there's plenty of reasons for that, but at the very least, yeah, I mean, you'd have to give me a good reason to think, why would God think any different now, right? The burden's going to be on you. But how about we look at what the Bible records as how he felt at the time, and then you come and tell me why all of a sudden he's going to feel any different. Where's the great revival? Where's the repentance? Because that has always been, and I can show you in the Bible where it says, hey, if they'll return unto me, if they'll call on my name, if they'll humble themselves and seek the Lord, and you know, then will I hear, right? That's all throughout the Old Testament. Go back to the law. That's what it says. When did that happen? I don't remember that happening. It didn't happen in, in the 40s, 1940s. It hasn't happened. It didn't happen in the 60s or 70s or 80s. It hasn't happened, that I, to, to my knowledge, at all. I'm not seeing a great revival of, of Christianity in Israel. But again, another passage that shows how, how did God really feel about these people. Matthew 23, verse 29 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. So they're saying, oh, we wouldn't have killed these prophets, right? They're, they're going and, and giving reverence to the sepulchers of these great prophets of old. And they're saying, well, we wouldn't have done that. But then what Jesus says, he says, wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. He says, you are the, and, and why does he call them the children? Because they, do, they would do the same exact things. They're saying they wouldn't do it, but they would. You know they would. Jesus knew they would. They're just the children of these murderers murderers themselves because they killed him they killed jesus they're, they're saying oh we wouldn't do that and yet there they go and they kill the son the son of god oh we wouldn't kill the prophet yeah because you don't view the real prophets as the prophets of god just like their fathers didn't view the real prophets as prophets of god either because they're children of the devil jesus was rejected Turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. John 1, verse 10, the Bible reads, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And even just that one passage that you probably have memorized, you know, he came unto his own, his own received him not. Again, put yourself in those shoes. Hey, I'm, I'm coming unto you. And he came unto them humbly and meekly. He's coming unto his own and is just rejected. How do you feel about that? How do you think God feels about that? Oh, it's not a big deal. Not a big deal. They're killing servants. You know, they kill the son. Not a big deal. You better believe it's a big deal. And here, we're, I told you we're going to get to this later, where the, where the blame really goes for the death of Jesus Christ. It, it doesn't go on the Romans, by the way. Now, I'm not saying they didn't have a hand in it, because they absolutely did. But, but just as... 
going all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, going all the way back to Adam and Eve, you know, accountability and blame can be shared by more than just one person. So the blame with, with the sin of Eve eating of the forbidden fruit, it didn't all just rest on Eve. You know, it didn't, and it, it was on Adam, it was on Eve, and it was on the serpent. God, God gave punishments to all of them. You know, they all had their excuses and were pointing the finger. Well, I mean, you know, to Adam, it was like, hey, well, the woman, I mean, she, she gave me the fruit, and that's why I ate. And she's like, well, well the serpent that you made, he, he, you know, that's, the, that's, that's why I ate. You know, and just, just passing the buck. But they all got punished for it. They all had to receive of that. And you could say, oh, well, it was the, it was the Roman soldiers that put it, hung them up on a cross. Well, they did, yeah, I'm sure. They got punished for that too, I bet. But you know what? What they did was ignorantly in unbelief. Not the Pharisees. Not the scribes. Not the lawyers. Not all the chief priests that were that were crying out, crucify him, crucify him. Let his blood be on us and on our children. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, look at verse number 14. Here's where the blame is, is given by God, by the, the Holy Scriptures. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. If I didn't mention the reference, we're in chapter 2, verse 14 of 1 Thessalonians. So he's, he's talking to the, the, the people of Thessalonica saying, you know, you became followers of the churches of God, and you also have suffered things of your own countrymen. So other people in your, own, your hometown, they're persecuting you even as they have of the Jews. Even as, you know, we've, we've suffered from the Jews, you've been suffering this. But he says, of the Jews, and then there's a colon, before the next verse. So now he's defining something about the Jews. That's what that colon means there. Who, who means the Jews, both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they please not God and are contrary to all men. That's a description of how the Jews were at this time. And again, where is the evidence that this is not continuing today to have that same attitude? Contrary to all men, persecuting, please not God. I don't see how Israel, modern day Israel is pleasing God. I don't see it. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sins all way. For the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Look, you have to accept the word of God for what it says. You can't make excuses for what the Bible says. In modern day, Judaism is the same religion as the Pharisees. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, Who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Look, if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. And they're rejecting Jesus. Now, that goes for everyone who's rejecting Jesus, but you know what? Specifically with the Jews, they do believe that there's a Messiah coming, but that Messiah is not Jesus. They're Antichrist, because they believe that Jesus is not the Christ. Revelation talks about them, too. Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 11. We're going to close on Mark 11. Revelation 2.9 says, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. These are the same people. Okay, a synagogue is a Jewish place of worship, and it always has been. So referring to it as the synagogue of Satan because they're children of the devil. Just like Jesus said in the book of John, hey, you're of your father the devil. And who is he talking to? Jews. He's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the scribes. He's saying, you're of your father the devil. I mean, th this is how you tie these verses together using scripture. It's very easy to do. Where else can you get those references? Say, oh, no, the synagogue of Satan is talking about someone else. They say they are Jews and are not. They claim to be Jews. Where else in scripture do you see people claiming to be Jews? I don't see anybody claiming to be Jews. Why would they want to? 
but nobody's claiming, oh, yeah, I'm a Jew. But why is it that they're not Jews? Because they're children of the flesh, but they're not children of promise. That's why. That they're not all Israel. They're, they're not all uh, Israel that are of Israel. You're saying God doesn't see them as being Jews. God doesn't see them as being of Israel. And that's the only thing that gets confusing is, is when you read through when you see the word Israel, is, is just trying to discern whether or not it's talking about the spiritual or physical Israel. And honestly, it's not that hard, but you do have to just take your time when you're reading the Bible, just make sure you're understanding who, if he's talking about the physical seed or if he's talking about the spiritual seed. We're going to close with one more parable, which again, now this one doesn't have as clear of a, of a definition, like this is what the parable is about. But I believe this fits perfectly with the nation of Israel as well. So um, I'm going to leave this here. But it's th that's why I left it for last, because this is not like the smoking gun. It's just one more piece and one more illustration. And since I started with a parable, you know, all of this, these, these parables are used for a reason. And they're, they're, they're giving this great picture of how God feels about this stuff. And this parable in Mark 11 matches perfectly with Mark 12. And there's a reason why they're in such close proximity as well, I believe, uh, in the scripture. Mark 11, look at verse number 12. This is the story of the fig tree that withers. So this is the fig tree that Jesus gets hungry and he sees it and he curses it. Verse 12 says, And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. Now, he's basically looking at it going like, hey, this looks like a good tree. It's got leaves. It's not dead. You know, it, it should be able to be totally capable of producing fruit. And he goes there wanting to receive the fruit of the tree, just like the, hus just like the, the, the Lord of the vineyard wanted to receive of the fruit of the vineyard, right? But when he sent for it, he got nothing. Jesus comes to this fig tree, looking for fruit, and when he gets there, there's nothing there. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Now, obviously, there's a reason for this. It's not because Jesus just had a short temper and he's just all upset. Man, I was so hungry. Man, you're cursed, you tree. Jesus was just walking around and just cursing things because he got a little upset because he's hangry. All right? That's... <laughs> This was done on purpose to illustrate a greater truth. It, it wasn't, it, it literally was not just because he's, he's hangry and then, okay, well now forget it. You're just not going to produce any fruit anymore. It's showing a greater spiritual symbolism. Now, the next thing that happens in this story is when he goes and clears out the temple. And he casts out all the, all the people who have defiled the temple of God. And again, I think... And then we're going to pick back up with the fig tree again. So the placement of this in between is also, I believe, telling and helping the interpretation of what is the fig tree even talking about when he curses it. Verse 15 says, and they, can't, and they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple and he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations a house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves? And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. And when even was come, he went out of the city. So basically, this is all the information we get. He comes in, and he's saying, Get out of here. Get all of these things. Take them out of here. You're just a bunch of thieves. You don't really belong here anymore. Just like the husbandmen of the vineyard were a bunch of thieves because they stole of the fruit of the vineyard and didn't give to the owner thereof. And, and they totally misappropriated everything that they were doing there instead of doing things righteously, righteously and decently and in order the way that God prescribed, the way the Lord prescribed things to be done. So that cursing of that fig tree was symbolic of this this damnation of the physical you know children of israel and their position in god's eyes as being that chosen 
uh, tree that was supposed to bring forth a bunch of fruit. Well, you know what? It didn't bring forth any fruit. So he says, you know what? Now you're cursed. Now you are cursed. They cursed themselves when they, when they, when they said, bring the, you know, the blood of Jesus on us and on our, and our seed. Verse 20 says, and in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. And in another, another uh, gospel, it talks about, like, they were astonished how fast it happened. Yeah. Just like that. God was able to take the kingdom away from the, from the physical seed and give it to another nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And as soon as he did that, it's done. Done. That's without repentance. When Jesus does something like that, it's done. There's no, no going back to that. Obviously, there's a lot of other issues we could talk about with, the, with Israel and the children of Israel and, you know, that there's still a remnant and, and it's all based on those that believe. But that's the important part of it. And, and you know, we, we've got to take God's word for what it says. And where people are wrong, they're wrong. Where people are right, they're right. But we could boldly stand on the word of God and say, look, th this is clear. This is unequivocal. I mean, no one's going to change my mind on Israel. <laughs> There's too much scripture on it. And I have no other preconceived ideas that's going to hold me. There's no, I have no ties one way or the other on this. It's simply what the Bible says. I've, there's, no, there's no draw for, for believing one way or another other than just wanting to know the truth and, and just accepting God's word for what it says. And you say, Pastor Bruce, why does this even really matter? You know, well, it matters very significantly. And I've said this in the past. I preach on one of the reasons I preach on this is because it has so many ramifications of what people do when, when you're supporting. Actually, these Christians think they're doing a good thing by supporting Israel, and they're on the wrong side. I mean, it's like they're fighting against God. They haven't turned to the Lord. Why, should, why in the world should we be supporting them? Not for a second. It's like you're fighting against the Lord. And not only that, it does impact national policy and wars and agendas when, when people are all supportive of going and fighting for a wicked country. That is a big ramification on, on our troops and our people here going and getting involved and entangled in some, in some foreign war that we have no business in at all. Definitely not supporting a bunch of God-hating Jews. They don't hate God. Yes, they do. They've made up their own God. Like they have time and time and time and time again in the past. That pattern hasn't changed. Just like so many other people have made up their own gods. But when, when, you, when you hate the Lord Jesus Christ, and when, you're, when your religious texts have some horrible things to say about our Lord and Savior. I mean, you want to talk about getting God angry. You read the filth in, in the Talmud and in their, in their holy texts, it, it's hard to even see. Like, part of me wishes I'd never even seen that filth just because it's, it's, it's so bad. I mean, it's just so blasphemous. But it's out there. And, and people teach that and believe that, and you think that God's going to bless you for blessing people that believe that stuff? No way. And by the way, last point, it is a belief. It's the faith that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the genetics. I'm not talking about someone who looks Jewish that, oh, you have this hatred for these Jews and you're anti-Semitic. I don't care if they descended from Shem. I'm not, I'm not anti-Semitic. But their religion is a horrible religion and one of the worst religions of the world because it's completely Christ-rejecting. And, and they are completely at odds with the Lord and not something that we should be defending at all. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for, this, for your word. I pray that you please help us and maintain a humble spirit that we would give um, our ultimate loyalty unto you and to your words. And God, I pray that you would please help us to have discernment and, and give us uh, wisdom and knowledge, Lord, and I pray that you would just help us to be able to preach the truth, uh, even if it's not popular, Lord, when, it, when it's in season, out of season, Lord, that we would just stand on your word, and we ask that you would um, give to us 
that, that knowledge and wisdom liberally, as you promised in, in the book of James, and that you would um, just help us to, to be better servants and better workers for you. We, we want to bring forth the fruits to, to bring honor and glory unto your name, and we thank you that you've entrusted us with the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.